welcome to this episode of Military History Inside Out. Today I speak with Dr. William Glenn Robertson, who's uh, written an extensive book on the Chickamauga campaign of the U.S. Civil War. Well, thank you and enjoy. I'm speaking with Dr. William Glenn Robertson, author of River of Death, the Chickamauga Campaign, Volume 1, The Fall of Chattanooga. Thank you for speaking with me. It's my pleasure, Chris. So, uh, first, tell me, how did you get into uh, studying and writing history? I, I was born into a family that was always historically minded. Uh, one branch of it, descending from John Johnson, an ancient planter at Jamestown, Virginia, in about 1611. I was I was born at uh, the end of World War II, and my young childhood was the Korean War. And as I grew up uh, with an affinity for military toys and military books, history books, uh, as a southerner, I was interested in the Civil War in Virginia. And I recall as a young child, I was shown a map uh, of Virginia that marked the Civil War battles uh, with cross sabers, mm -hmm. and there was a cross saber down near uh, where I lived in Isle of Wight County, and that started me into uh, investigating the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I was sixty miles south of Petersburg, Virginia, and so that was my first interest uh, when I discovered there was a very small battle. Uh, known to the Federals as the Battle of Deserted House near where I lived uh, in an adjacent county. Uh, I had my, my mother take me to a local library, and there we found both the uh, official records, Volume 18, and the Civil War Atlas to accompany the records. And there were maps of this little fight and lots of maps of Petersburg, and so I really got uh, into into that. In, in high school, I founded a Civil War roundtable, and we raised enough money to go to the great reenactment of uh, Bull Run in 1961 as uh, as a group. Mm -hmm. I, I then went to uh, the University of Richmond. I did a uh, senior thesis on the Civil War in uh, Western Tidewater, Virginia. Went to uh, the University of Virginia. I took a master's degree and eventually uh, a PhD. Both the master's degree and the doctorate resulted in manuscripts that were subsequently published. Mm -hmm. The master's degree was uh, the Battle of Old Men and Young Boys, the first battle for Petersburg, originally published in 1989, reissued in 2015 by Salvis Beatty. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the doctorate Backdoor to Richmond on the Bermuda 100 campaign, published originally in 1987, and due to be published, uh, republished next year also by Savas Beatty. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I then spent uh, 10 years in academe at a variety of institutions in Virginia, New Mexico, and Colorado, where I taught wherever uh, the curriculum permitted mm -hmm. military history. And in 1981, I went to, uh, took a job here at the uh, Command and General Staff College of the Army here in Leavenworth, Kansas, and that got me into uh, doing something called the Staff Ride, which we can go into as you wish, but that's what led me to Chickamauga eventually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no, at this point, I guess uh, I'd like to um, talk about the book itself. Uh, tell me about it. What I wanted to do when I decided to write a book on Chickamauga was to use the materials that I had gathered here at the Staff College for the Chickamauga Staff Ride course mm -hmm. write a comprehensive and as near as I could all-inclusive book on the campaign as well as the battle of Chickamauga. Uh, the, the volume, the current volume is the first of two. Uh, it covers the period from 4 July 1863, the end of the Tullahoma campaign, to 9 September 
which was the federal occupation of Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. The second volume will take the story to the Confederate counterstrokes and the large battle of Chickamauga and culminate uh, most likely with the relief of William Rosecrans in mid-October 1863. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, not just tell the high command side of the story or just the soldier life side of the story. I wanted to make it comprehensive and cover all of that. I wanted to tell both sides as equally as I could without uh, prejudice in the way. Uh, let's cover with the Confederate side because of the uh, scarcity of some resources, hmm. but I wanted to make it as balanced as I could. The campaign will cover probably three quarters of the two volumes, and the battle will take up uh, the rest. Okay. Um, how did, so with, uh, so much, uh, in mind, how did you, uh, divide up the book? You know, is it chronological? Is it, uh, s sort of subject by subject? Or how does that, how, how does it go? This is, uh, I write narrative history. I, uh, I guess you might say I tell a story. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's going to be in chronological order. It's going to, within a certain time period, say in a chapter, it will, uh, once the narrative starts moving forward after the introductory chapters where I describe the armies and the personalities, uh, when it becomes chronological, I try to cover what's happening with both sides in a given period. Some chapters will cover a month, some chapters will cover two or three days, some chapters will cover one day. So, apart from sort of a, a history of the campaign, do you feel like uh, it's, it's revolved around uh, any sort of theme, um, something different from, from what's been done before or anything like that? Yes. Uh, my time, my 30 years actually spent teaching at the Army Staff College showed me a great deal about military affairs that are both timeless over the centuries and often not covered very well by historians. And so I had a number of themes that I wanted to bring out and weave them in threads throughout the chronological narrative. Mm -hmm. I can identify probably about uh, at least six themes that, if you'd like, I could list them, uh, or we can move on in another direction. No, I'd like you to list the themes and discuss those. That would be great. Okay, number one is the role of personality among senior leaders for the most part. Mm -hmm. How did William Rosecrans get along with his corps commanders? How did the corps commanders get along with their division commanders? And on down the chain. Because the personalities of people make a great deal of, of difference in how they interact. Mm -hmm. I saw that so much working for the Army and being the command historian for her senior leaders like, for instance, David Petraeus when he was here at Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. And I see how the personalities affected the decisions that were made and how subordinates reacted. And so that will be for both the Confederates and the Federals uh, one of the major themes uh, in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a second... Uh, theme would be the effect of terrain and the mapping of it done by both sides. This campaign, for for my money, is probably covering the most difficult terrain in the American Civil War for major armies. Mm -hmm. Grant had the Mississippi River to support him with the Navy. Uh, the distances in the Virginia theater were minuscule compared with what's being dealt with out in the middle part of the country, and the mountain ranges of the Appalachian chain, the Cumberland Plateau, Sand Mountain, Lookout Mountain, and ultimately Midbury Ridge, all of those had to be traversed in this campaign. Mm 
the mountains are roughly a thousand to twelve hundred feet above the valleys, and they were in a countryside that was essentially undeveloped. It had only been taken from the Cherokees thirty years when this campaign occurred. Hmm. And so, getting over the mountains, and if you've never seen them, and you drive over them as I did so many times. You wonder how they were able to move thousands of troops and thousands of wagons mm -hmm. up the steep uh, mountains. Mm -hmm. The maps that assisted the commanders are are quite interesting in and of themselves. The Confederate ones uh, vary widely. The Army in Cumberland, Rosecrans Army, however, had a major. Uh, mapping operation of topographical engineers, mm -hmm. and they developed a system uh, by a man named William Marginat, one of the engineers, where they would create a map and they would have a mobile printing press that would travel along and they would print these maps, and if there was an area they didn't know about what was in it, they would put question marks on the map itself mm -hmm. and say, send us information as you move into this area. Now, these maps weren't perfect, but they are really good in helping you to figure out what they were, what they knew, and what they were saying when they write an order or a message, and they represent a place or a terrain beacon. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they are utterly wrong, but it's the way the maps show things. Mm -hmm. uh, the chief of staff of the uh, Army of the Cumberland, James Garfield. I found to be uh, especially uh, not very good at understanding what the maps were showing him or having any idea of the spatial relationships. Uh, so the terrain itself is uh, a second thing. Yeah. I, w I was going to mention that, yeah, every time I, I go to the Shenandoah Mountains, um, I can't help but think back to, uh, you know, thousands of men and, as you say, wagons and, and just cannon being moved through there, and I know they tried to use gaps in low ground when possible, but then you think about, you know, if it were rainy or cold and just muddy, and, and it, it's just amazing to think about people trying to move and, and campaign through through that kind of area. To give you a brief example of a personal experience, when I built the, uh, the Army staff ride to Chickamauga, my associates and I took rail cars down to that area, and we tried to, wherever we could, follow the original tracks up the mountains. And in the early 1980s, you could still take a passenger vehicle, uh, a rental sedan, up the route of the Alex McCook 20th Corps mm -hmm. over the mountain from the, uh, uh, from the Tennessee River Valley. And we ended up breaking a spring or something. We tore up the rental car. And in more recent years, the road has gone back to nature. Uh -huh. and it doesn't even exist anymore. And it was bad in the 1980s. What must it have been in uh, 1863? Mm -hmm. So terrain is a critical part of the campaign phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, to, to resume the, the, the themes, yes. uh, third one would be uh, the role of scouts and spies for both sides. There is in the National Archives a manuscript called Summaries of the News Reaching General Rosecrans Headquarters during this campaign. Hmm. It's sort of like intelligence journal created by uh, a Captain David Swaim, S-W-A-I-M, who worked for Garfield and, as it turns out, was uh, with Garfield when he died in the, after his uh, assassination. In the 1880s, so he was a Garfield man from the beginning. But anyway, Swain kept this sort of diary, and whenever Rose Friends or the Army would get some information, they would write it down. Now, he didn't keep it perfectly, and sometimes the dates get skewed a little bit, mm -hmm. but within that, you can learn who did various scouting activities, and I've been able to identify some of those people including a, a father and son team in Chattanooga who were reporting from behind the Confederate lines 
on what was going on, on the railroads around Chattanooga and the city itself. Hmm. And I've never seen any other book that's addressed those two people. Hmm. And you can learn that from this uh, intelligence journal. On the Confederate side, there is a very brief and hard to decipher Confederate scout book at uh, what used to be the Museum of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. And that, for a few days, gives a good idea of uh, the Confederates, what they were learning as they were interacting with the Federals advancing. Mm -hmm. So these these scouts and spies played a much greater role than uh, is heretofore been identified in, in books about the campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, going on to theme number four, the role of logistics. To sustain armies of 60,000 people, enormous work has to be done feeding them, feeding their horses, keeping the horses uh, and mules shod. All of this has to happen before you can get to a battle. Mm -hmm. and, where, and most logisticians do not tell their own story. So you have to pick out bits and pieces and everywhere that I can, I try to emphasize the movement of supplies, either by railroad or by wagon, or uh, things like for the Confederates who didn't have prepackaged rations in any form. Mm -hmm. They spend an enormous amount of time cooking rations. They will slaughter beef, and on the spot, Either everybody will do it individually or in some units uh, that would be designated cooks. And they would spend all day cooking up meat and then distribute it out to the soldiers. And they would go two or three days and then they'd have to stop and cook meat again. And that's, uh, that's a function that's uh, addressed a lot in soldier diaries, but not a lot in uh, history books. So let, let me ask you briefly then, I guess, did the South lack sort of the, the manufacturing uh, process to, to make prepackaged rations, or, you know, what was the reason for that disparity? Well, actually, both, both sides used uh, slaughtered beef, uh, but the North had the better uh, manufacturing of the hard crackers or hard tack. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would come prepackaged, made in the north, and be boxed up. And I don't see much of that happening in the south. They were just trying to uh, grind corn into flour and wheat into flour, and as they found grist mills, and then they would just cook it up together. So, so the north had more prepackaged hardtack, it would appear, in this campaign than the south did. But both sides carried uh, beef cattle with them. And you can imagine trying to move a herd of cattle across a swinging pontoon bridge 1,200 feet long over the Tennessee River. Hmm. Very, very difficult to do for the Federals. And I've got soldiers who talk about that. Uh, they end up just swimming them across. Uh. The fifth uh, theme I try to address uh, periodically as it becomes relevant is the role of staffs, the mostly younger men who wrote down the orders, copied the orders, sent the orders out to the field. When occasionally they were asked their opinion, they would advise their principal commanders. Uh, sometimes they would get things garbled. Sometimes they would not report what they were supposed to report. And occasionally that would have consequences. And so I try to, wherever I can, highlight these people, who they are, what they're trying to do, uh, how they're trying to manage things for their uh, respective commanders. Mm -hmm. uh, and for both armies, I have sections that identify the uh, principal staff officers of uh, both Bragg and Rosecrans and uh, whatever little biographical information I can provide four of them. Mm -hmm. Most of them were young. Uh, some of them had political connections to their boss. Some of them had uh, family connections to their boss, like General Polk, uh, sons and sons-in-law and nephews and such. 
And some of these people did a great job, and some of them uh, didn't do so well. Mm -hmm. That will continue to be a theme in Volume 2 when we get to the battle. So, if I can briefly uh, mention, it seems it, it's kind of interesting to see to the extent to which the Civil War was almost uh, a conflict between uh, families and, um, you know, family groups and, and sort of people uh, fighting, maybe not so much for politics, but because they were part of one group or another that chose one side or another, if that makes sense. And especially like in local areas, you know, one family might not like another, so they're fighting on different sides for that reason and maybe not politics. There is a section of North Georgia that features very heavily in uh, Volume 2 called Macklemore's Cove. It's uh, east of Lookout Mountain, and it's a little V-shaped valley that uh, is made by a lookout and a spur called Pigeon Mountain. And it'll be a place where Bragg is going to try to trap uh, part of the Federal Army. The point I want to make in regard to what you just said is that the people, most of the people who lived in that valley seem to have been pro-Union. And even though they would hold two or three slaves, surprisingly they were pro-Union and very, very helpful to uh, the Federal Army units that came into that area. I found uh, numerous occasions of that, and I've looked up the folks in the... Uh, census of 1860, and I found that uh, there was this tendency among these people who lived in Morse Cove. Now, if you go east of Pigeon Mountain, out into the wider, flatter area where the town of Lafayette, or Lafayette as we might say, but they call it Lafayette, mm -hmm. uh, they were pro-Southern. And even today, in my 25 years of running tours down there, you talk to local people, and they say those people over in the cove are different, even today, from us. I mean, we don't get along with them. Mm. And so, you do have uh, these little pockets of, say, pro-unionism, even though some of these people are, are slave folks. Mm -hmm. And, and they tend to go, uh, some people could follow their economic interests, some people follow their political interests, some people follow their family ties. Uh, Thomas Crittenden, commanding the uh, 21st Corps in the Army of the Cumberland, had a brother, George, who was a Confederate general for a while until he was cashiered for drunkenness. Hmm. So, so, and both came from Kentucky and were the sons of the late senator, famous John Crittenden. Mm -hmm. So you get uh, all sorts of family interactions. George Thomas, the best corps commander in the Union Army of the Cumberland, was a Virginian from very near to where I was raised, mm -hmm. and his family disowned him when he stayed with the Union. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a, it is indeed a civil war. Yeah. And when it comes to local differences, that always makes me wonder how it feeds into the uh, sort of the intelligence theme that you mentioned, you know, how you get your information. There is a family that lived in the cove by the name of Gower. P-O-W-E-R is the way some people spell it. And I looked up Mr. Gower, and he had a son in the Union Army. Hmm. And he became a source of information for the Confederates maneuvering in the code against the Union Army. Huh. And the information he provides is not helpful to the Confederates. He multiplies the number of federal troops they're facing far beyond reason, and so he's providing disinformation to the Confederates operating in the area. Hmm. And they don't seem to be aware of that. And so the campaign goes in a certain direction, partially because of the disinformation that Mr. Gower provided. Wow. That's fascinating. Uh, once you drill down into the very sharp details of things, you start finding all these little interconnections that, uh, you know, if you're writing at the 30,000-foot level, mm -hmm. you don't even know exist. 
you know, that comes at a cost, and eventually we can get into, you know, that. But the, the whole purpose of my study is to illuminate some of these deep, dark recesses that other people have just lost over. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I'm successful, maybe I'm not, but uh, that, that's what's been my, my purpose. Uh, I do want to get into the final theme very quickly, and then we can move on to other things. Yes. And that is the role of new technology uh, for this type, time of uh, American history. It would be the railroad and the telegraph. The railroad, the, the Army of Cumberland was totally dependent on a single track railroad stretching from the Tennessee River all the way back through Nashville to Louisville, Kentucky. They didn't have a river to help them out. They had crossed the river, but the river at Muscle Shoals could not sustain steamboats, so they couldn't use anything but wagon haul and railroads. And it was a single track, uh, first the Louisville and Nashville Railroad between those two cities, and then the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad all the way down into Chattanooga. Bragg, on the other hand, for the Confederates, had to depend on the Western and Atlantic Railroad to Atlanta. Once uh, he lost his contact with Knoxville when Burnside's Army of the Ohio uh, severed the line running to Bristol, Virginia, and then ultimately to Richmond. So railroads were critical to both armies in this campaign. And they were, they were not in good shape because they were southern railroads and they had not been well capitalized. And they wore out very, very quickly. So you get all sorts of potential train wrecks. And in fact, uh, on the night of the 13th of September, which is beyond volume one, there will be a massive uh, head-on collision between a troop train and a supply, a supply train, empty supply train. Uh, north of, uh, near Cartersville, Georgia. Mm-hmm. So, see, and that will affect the movements. Whenever the railroads are interdicted in any way, then people start running out of food, running out of forage, things like that. Mm-hmm. And it becomes a driver for how the campaign goes. When the mm-hmm. Confederates think that the Union is going to move north of Chattanooga, if you think logistically, they can't, because they can't sustain themselves in the barren area of the Cumberland Plateau. They have to follow the railroad, and the railroad comes to the Tennessee River Valley at Stevenson, Alabama, south of Chattanooga, and crosses the river at Bridgeport, Alabama. Mm -hmm. So if you think logistically, the, the Army of the Cumberland almost has to follow the railroad. And this is a fascinating study of how commanders who are trying to adapt the technology that is only 30 years old mm-hmm. think of us trying to deal with, uh, say, computers mm-hmm. 30, 40 years old. Uh, it takes some adaptation. Uh, yeah. So the railroad is new technology, and some people are good with it, and some people are not. Rosecrans had a, a speed bar that was a combination passenger car and locomotive called a steam dummy. They were built, uh, I forget now exactly where they were built. I think it was in Ohio. So they were built for city street running for railroads because they were thought not to frighten horses so much. Mm-hmm. But anyway, Rosecrans' uh, army took over three of these, and he uses them as a personal transport to run up and down from Bridgeport back to Stevenson uh, before they've crossed the uh, Cumberland Plateau up to Nashville. So he uses it as a command vehicle for a while. Mm-hmm. And that's a, a technology that was by no means available prior to that that time. And he adapts it perfectly. Uh, as far as the telegraph goes, the, the federal army both uses the infrastructure that exists, the landlines, and also has field telegraph trains that can string wire using something called the Beardsley Telegraph, 
and connect that to the land lines. So as Rosecrans Army advances across the river into uh, territory that not had not been theirs, they will rebuild the telegraph line. In fact, they will string a, a waterproof cable telegraph line under the Tennessee River at Bridgeport and then tap back into the railroad telegraph that goes over to Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. And then south of Chattanooga, they string these, uh, by stringing wire out of the back of wagons, they, they follow the army for a while into the mountains south of Chattanooga. And by that means, those friends can be in touch with Washington, D.C. within a matter of a few short hours. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for them, all they can provide is good wishes at that stage of the day because you can't move people that quickly. But the telegraph makes a world of difference for, for both armies, actually. So, in a sense, the, some of the stuff you say uh, brings to mind uh, maybe a generalization on my part, but, you know, nowadays I think people are, are sort of expecting and familiar with the the country being ready for natural disaster and war. We have things pre-positioned. Uh, we have highway systems that are designed to move. You know, military vehicles can use them. You know, every it feels like everything nowadays is prepared for disaster, whereas back during the time of the Civil War, it feels like it was a country that was not designed for war, natural disaster, or anything, and it was almost like a war occurred on top of, you know, a bunch of uh, people unaware that something like this might sweep through through their, their lands, so to speak. No one in American history had ever had to command armies of the size of Civil War armies, nor had they ever had to feed and clothe armies of such magnitude. So they were all learning on the fly. Uh, the South was ill-prepared to, with an infrastructure to handle railroads or manufacturing. The North, of course, was far better prepared. But in the campaign that I'm writing about, they are fighting in essentially a frontier environment mm -hmm. where there are no good roads. There is no valley pike, in other words, down where this is occurring, below Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. There aren't any metatomized roads. There aren't any good roads, hardly at all. And the railroads represent a quantum leap forward in their ability to sustain themselves. But once they get away from the railroads, they're dependent totally on army wagons pulled by six mules or sometimes more drag, being dragged up thousand foot grades. Mm -hmm. And they are so even though the United States was, particularly in the North, was industrializing, very little of that had occurred in the area where this campaign takes place. So it's it's a frontier campaign. Mm -hmm. The Federals do encounter a couple of uh, iron foundries that are being put together because of the war emergency in the campaign area, but they are uh, just nascent and aren't even in operation, so they're, what's being built is going to be destroyed by the federal. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Confederates uh, use caves in this area to mine uh, saltpeter or niter or gunpowder. Mm -hmm. uh, federals encounter uh, a number of those caves and destroy those operations. But it's all very much uh, vestigial, you know, compared with, say, what DuPont was doing in Delaware or something like that, or even in uh, Richmond, for that matter. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a frontier. I like that term, frontier. I think that, yeah, that, that kind of says it. It's interesting, yeah. Um, I'd like to turn towards the uh, resources you used to do your research. Um, you mentioned some of what you used. Can you elaborate on, on what you use sure. for your research? Certainly. I began, like everybody begins, with the official records, the War of the Rebellion official records of the Union and Confederate Army. Thousands of pages of battle reports, uh, message traffic, 
intelligence report. That's a, a foundation. Once you get that foundation established, you start looking around the things that didn't make it into the official records. The National Archives has a number of useful things, many of which are remaining untapped when you get into the the details of the Inspector General's reports and the Quartermaster reports and all those things. Most people don't work with them, and I've only worked with them a little bit. I did have a student uh, go into that heavily uh, with a master's degree here at Staff College. But the National Archives does also contain personal papers and the papers of details that don't didn't make it into the official records. So you have to work in various things at the National Archives, and that's a, sadly, that's a tough place to work uh, because the stuff is literally coming apart in your hands uh, mm-hmm. when you handle it. And I won't, I'm not trying to drop a dime on the National Archives folks. They do the best they can in a hard situation. Mm-hmm. But our, our paper documents from that era are rapidly deteriorating. Nonetheless, there are useful things. Things like uh, certain diaries, uh, General Thomas's papers, things like that. Uh, once you get beyond that, it's a question of going to the papers of the principals. William Rosecrans' papers are at uh, UCLA, California, mm-hmm. uh, because he ended up out there in California. Preston Bragg's papers are in Cleveland, Ohio, at the uh, Western Reserve Historical Society. They are hugely important. When you go beyond that, then you start working through tens, twenties, maybe hundreds of repositories throughout the United States, starting with major uh, university libraries, uh, major uh, state historical societies, uh, eventually ending up with... uh, little historical societies and communities scattered throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing how much there is scattered around the country. I have done everything I can to get as much as I can. Part of the reason why it's taken me so long to do this, but it's there's still plenty out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do have to give kudos to uh, my friend David Powell, who's just published a three-volume Chickamauga series. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave and I might differ on some details of the campaign and the battle, but he is an indefatigable researcher. He came here to the staff college a number of years ago, and we allowed him to copy everything we had gathered up to that point. And in exchange, he has provided me with... Uh, CDs of all of his research up to the point of his publication. Mm-hmm. And he has visited far more, either by letter or by going, far more of these local repositories uh, than I've been able to get to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and finally, in terms of places, uh, the National Park Service, Chickamauga, Chattanooga National Military Park, with uh, Jim Ogden as the principal historian, another uh, great uh, benefactor to me. Uh, they have gathered so much. I have given them a lot of stuff I found. Dave Powell has given them a lot of stuff. But they get things from people that just walk in and say, I've got great grandpa's diary. Would you like a copy? Hmm. And so they have several filing cabinets full of essentially primary source material there at the park. Uh, another force that's uh, almost equally good in certain respects is Stone River National Battlefield. They have all the stuff they have like that. Mm-hmm. They have digitized and have put online. So you don't have to go to Murfreesboro, although it's a pleasant a place to visit and work. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, and there are things I have found at Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield. Uh, there are odds and ends just all over the country. Yeah. And 
I've got right now I've got over forty one thousand new cards. Wow. And it's still growing. I estimate by the time I finish, if I live long enough, it'll <laughs> maybe be four five thousand. Yeah. But uh, it, it's amazing how much it's out there. And I can find, say, a staff officer's journal that really lets you know who likes who and who doesn't get along with who and, and what is going on in the internal work to the headquarters. It's golden. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the research task, you could just spend forever on it, and I've spent an awful lot of time, but I've gained a lot of insights from doing it. Mm-hmm. What part of the research was most enjoyable? Well, it, it's always like panning for gold. You know, spend move a lot of earth to get a few nuggets. Mm-hmm. And I would say probably the most the most revealing was the uh, the diary of Bragg's assistant adjutant general George Brent. Mm-hmm. And it's in uh, his Bragg's papers at Western Reserve. Uh, it's not listed as being written by George Brent, but a number of years ago, some people pretty well proved that George Brent was the author of it. And that gives you every day an insight into Bragg's thinking and what is being reported at that headquarters. And that is just so useful. That type of thing, uh, similarly, there's a diary uh, that's partially printed in the official records of uh, Lieutenant William Richmond, who was an aide to the United Pope, mm-hmm. Bragg War Command. And Richmond is even more open about what's happening at the headquarters at his level than, than Brent is. Brent is very circumspect. Richmond lets it, uh, lets it fly. And surprisingly, the official records people who put it together and printed it expurgated Richmond's diary. Everywhere there is a mention in the original diary of somebody getting drunk or somebody getting into a fight, that is not in the published version in the official records. Hmm. But it is in the version that is in General Polk's papers at the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. So those those types of things are what uh, I find just fascinating. Where and there are other soldiers' diaries. Uh, there is a published one from the 59th Illinois, where uh, a lieutenant comments a lot about his division commander having his wife with him on the campaign, which was against the rules. <laughs> but Jefferson C. Davis did what he wanted. Uh, he's the man that uh, shot uh, Major General Bull Nelson in Louisville, Kentucky in the previous year and got away with murder. Hmm. Uh, Davis has his wife traveling with him in the campaign, and he doesn't say much about it. Obviously, he doesn't say anything about it, actually, but hmm. one of his staff uh, guys mentions it. But this lieutenant's diary published uh, Lieutenant Chesley Mossman uh, he comments regularly about Tom Mrs. Davis and her companion going this way and the human details are what interests me. Mm-hmm. So that's been the most enjoyable finding that yes indeed these are real people, not cardboard cutouts. Mm-hmm. They uh, you know, they had wants and needs and wishes just like the rest of us. What did you discover that was most surprising in your research? A couple of things. First, there is a brigade in the Army of the Cumberland called the Lightning Brigade, commanded by Colonel John Wilder. That regiment, or that brigade of four, eventually five regiments, has been given a lot of favorable press over the last two or three decades. And there are multiple books about the Lightning Brigade. Mm-hmm. Their reputation, in my opinion, far exceeds a fact. 
uh, Wilder is credited. Wilder is quite a quite an individual. He knew how to brag Phil Rosebrands by presenting him a blooded stallion that he had captured in Tennessee. He got dispensation to do pretty much whatever he wanted. Wilder's reputation was such in his books, and I, I won't go into who's written them. People can look up those. Uh, one of the authors is recently deceased. The, the books say that Wilder masterminded the deception operation north of Chattanooga that made the Confederacy look north while Rosecrans crossed south of the city. And this deception operation is given an awful lot of print ink by a lot of people. And the Wilder story is he was the only guy there. Mm-hmm. Sort of like the famous story about Theodore Roosevelt's uh, account of the Spanish American War, alone in Cuba. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like Wilder was alone up there in the, the Chattanooga Valley. It turns out that, from my research, any of the deception operations of any consequence should be ascribed to Brigadier General William Hazen, who for a time commanded the multiple brigades in the deception operation. Hmm. And by reading all the diaries of Wilder's command, this is occasionally bombarding the city of Chattanooga. They didn't do much of this uh, deception. The deception involved throwing yourself way upstream, uh, playing music at odd locations, <laughs> Uh, popping up wood being heard across the river and throwing the straps into the river looked like you were building boats, all that kind of stuff. Mm. Wilder gets all the credit, and I just don't see it. So that will uh, that will upset the Wilder aficionados. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the other uh, surprising thing is that as I read it, Bragg is a much better commander. He knew his the cards he had to play. He knew he had an inferior sized army until he got reinforced. He knew he couldn't hold the river line in that mountainous terrain. He had a plan to deal with that once the Federals crossed. He attempted to put it into play twice, and subordinates failed both times. And if you read most of the standard accounts of the campaign, Bragg is an ignoramus who doesn't, including the biographers of Bragg, Mm -hmm. except for the most recent one, uh, he is portrayed as somebody over his head, incapable of doing anything, just being totally lost in terms of fighting a campaign. And I don't see that. I see him knowing what he, making a good assessment of the situation, being willing to give up the city temporarily to maneuver against the enemy once the enemy uh, makes himself known. Mm-hmm. Now, it doesn't work out, and that'll play out in volume two, but I see Bragg as a man equally as deaf in mounting a campaign or planning a campaign as Rosecrans is. Uh, that will not be the view that uh, you'll find in virtually every uh, book on Chickamauga. Hmm. Was there an issue that you researched that was particularly difficult to come to a conclusion on, or maybe you still feel like you haven't, uh, you know, figured it out yet? There's there's a little bit in in the volume that's not yet done, although I've written the chapters. Hmm. Uh, the the Macamonis Cove episode uh, has a lot of uh, things you can't really nail down. You have to read into the message traffic what uh, actually happened. And I am finding that it depends on who writes the message, the sequence of messages that affect the operational commander on the ground, T.C. Heinlein. And I discovered that the messages coming from Bragg's headquarters are 
diametrically opposed to each other. Bragg will write one thing, and his chief of staff, William McCall, will write another. And I'm coming to be able to posit that that's a big part of why the episode was badly for the Confederates. But uh, that's in, in volume two. Okay. Uh, so that, that won't be in, in this first volume, but I am finding that I've, I've got a hypothesis and I'm going to put it out there that uh, I'd like to have a little more documentation on that. Was there anything that uh, that you found that emotionally moved you, either something amusing or something that saddened you? In working with the soldiers' diaries and letters, every now and then you might find something amusing, but more often you find things that are really saddening. I found the counts of people being shot inadvertently by somebody fooling around in camp hmm. and dying as a result. Uh, I found an account of uh, an ammunition explosion up on the Cumberland Plateau near uh, Pomone, Tennessee, where a number of Union soldiers are badly burned and those that survived are disfigured, and those that don't, their campaign ended right there before they ever saw the Confederates. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be, in volume two, a very sad story of a young man from Illinois who's wounded and lies on the battlefield for seven calendar days before he gets more than just something to eat, and he's immobile. Mm -hmm. And he's then exchanged, and they first thought that he would survive the amputation of his leg, but it turns out he's, it doesn't, and it doesn't work out for him. And he writes the last letter uh, that's, uh, I used to read it on the battlefield, and it would make a stone weep to read that. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you find young people, young soldiers whose lives I, I keep thinking now as I continue on the project what a tragedy for the country just in terms of the loss of an entire generation almost of young people mm -hmm. who could have done so much to make this country greater in the latter half of the 19th century mm -hmm. that they are buried by the destructive war mm -hmm. uh, that's what that's what saddens me uh, the most. These individual uh, stories. Uh, there's, there's a guy who has to go back home because his wife and children are swept away and drowned in a flood in uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, I think. And you think about what he's got to deal with. There are seven or eight Union soldiers that drive across in the Tennessee River. Uh, many of them just frolicking in the water until they get in over their head. They can't swim, and nobody can save them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one man who's uh, trying to move a mule onto a raft, and the mule kicks him, knocks him out into the water, and he drowns. Mm -hmm. uh, you think about the fragility of life even before the bullets start flying in a big battle. And one of my uh, reviewers at UNC Press I gave too much space to soldier stories. Hmm. And I had to differ with him because I, I wasn't writing a, a 30,000 foot level story. They were individual stories that people need to know about. Hmm. And that's, unfortunately, most of them are very, very sad stories. Can you speak to any difficulties you had in getting the book published? Or, or any difficulties in getting it finished, and uh, how you overcame those? I, after my Bermuda 100 book came out with the University of Delaware Press, and maybe even after the second one came out, in the late 80s, I approached uh, UNC Press at uh, the annual convention of the Southern Historical Association. And it, 
to kick them off and throw to them. And they were kind enough to accept it and give me a contract and a small advance. And then I got embroiled in moving up the chain of management here at the staff college. And my son was born, and life got very complicated. Mm-hmm. And they stayed with me, probably because they had invested a, a small sum. Mm-hmm. But they stayed with me, and eventually, once I retired seven years ago, I was able to move along more rapidly with it. And so I give the press all kudos for sticking with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, they thought the original volume was too long, or the reader thought the volume was too long. One of them did. Mm-hmm. Right? One reader did, one reader did. And so the editor, two editors removed from the one that signed me to the contract, they wanted it cut down. And so I had to take a year to cut it down. I cut 70,000 words from the manuscript. Probably about 20%, maybe a little more. Mm -hmm. And... In some respects, I had to cut out some good things, and that was unfortunate. But in other respects, it tightened up the prose, and so it was beneficial, and shortened the paragraphs, because I tended to write extra long paragraphs. Hmm. Okay. And so, after I sent the manuscript in a couple years ago, then they wanted it cut down. And so we took another year to do that. And so uh, it's been a fairly long road to the home, as they say in the town. Mm-hmm. But it's, uh, I guess now, and it'll be out in a month, or left, or whenever. Mm-hmm. This is the final thing that, uh, this interview, the final thing that I'm uh, on the hook to do. I'm not Living where I do, uh, I'm not going to be going on any particular book tour or anything. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that would be uh, productive for either the press or myself, uh, whoever had to pay for it. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, I, I, I have to just speak well of UNC Press for, you know, sticking with me for essentially 20 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, I am... Four chapters into volume two, and every day I continue to work more on that as I continue to add a few more sources and new parts. Um, it's a uh, it's been a long process, and in the in the course of that, I've also revised my two earlier books for another publisher, and uh, so I've been I've been busy as a scholar in my declining years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have. Um, where uh, where can so your books can be found on Amazon and that sort of thing? Do you do you happen to also have a website or I guess you don't do social media or anything where you uh, write your thoughts? I, I am on Facebook. I mostly lurk there. Hmm. I listed on Facebook, and I'm not sure how I would what I would do to you know push it there. Uh, and the people that I know from back when my childhood days. I don't think they'd care to read it anyway. <laughs> but I, uh, you know, they'd be happy to say they knew somebody who was an author, but they're not going to read a big book called Civil War Battle, most of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do not have a, uh, a website or a .com or anything. Okay. I just wanted to check about that. Um, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts? I, I, I'll say this. In my writing career, I have tried to look dispassionately at a number of Civil War commanders. And in the case of Benjamin Butler, in my book on the Bermuda 100 campaign, Back Door to Richmond, mm-hmm. I found that he was not, in my view, nearly as bad as the common knowledge would have him. 
a number of years ago, I was asked to do uh, an article by Derek Gallagher on Dan Sickles at Gettysburg and the Peach Orchard. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know anything about that beyond the general facts of the case. And he said, be controversial. Gary did. <laughs> well, the only way I can be controversial is to defend him. Sickles moving out forward of Cemetery Ridge Line. And when I looked at it, I found there was a case to be made for Sickles. And so I wrote that article that way. In this book, I'm going to provide a more favorable view of Braxton Bragg that will probably make not a ripple in the historiography. Another example, uh, more recently, I was asked to write about the black divisions in the Overland Campaign uh, of 1864, Mm -hmm. which brought me, of course, to the crater and the destruction of uh, the division. And I essentially defended Ambrose Burnside's role in that debacle. Mm -hmm. And that's made, none of this has made a bit of difference because I look for books that come out subsequently to see if they at least acknowledge that I had written. Mm-hmm. And most of them don't. Now, one of them on a new book, a reasonably new book on the crater, does mention that what I wrote existed in a, a chapter in another UNC press called Black Soldiers in Blue. Mm-hmm. But he didn't, uh, he didn't take any of my points. So, my final thought is, I don't expect to change anybody's mind. Because Civil War historiography is, seems to me, so set in its narrative that no matter how much new information you find or how much new analysis you bring, people still want to hear, as one of my colleagues put it, the same old stories told in the same old way. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to have a new interpretation that uh, moves the needle. Yeah. As uh, some of my recent uh, colleagues trying to uh, pull back the tide of U.S. Grant hagiography that's uh, welling over us. Mm-hmm. Uh, they tried and said, let's take another look at some of these things we thought we knew were true that really aren't and they're not being received very well either. Mm-hmm. So I don't expect to change many minds. What I do want is for people to at least give it a pair here. Mm-hmm. And that's all I can do. Yeah. It seems that, uh, you know, big changes within uh, a field like history, it takes maybe a generation for people to, to maybe come around or or such. I've seen also that that in archaeology as well. Um, things just, changes move slowly in ways of thinking, so. It's, it's just like, uh, as, I, as I just gave you the quotation from a friend of mine, people really don't want to look at new interpretations. It seems. I mean, the reading public, by and large. Mm-hmm. They expect to get a standard story, and they're disappointed if they don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Uh, Well, thank you for speaking with me. It has been my great pleasure. Thank you. This podcast has been presented by War Scholar. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com for more great interviews and military history information. Your visits help support this podcast. One of the best ways to provide feedback for this podcast is is to rate me on iTunes. Please give me a good rating if you liked it, or feel free to give me a bad rating if you didn't. I'll use that feedback to make this a better podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram under Chris Alvarez War Scholar. That's Chris without an H, C-R-I-S. On Facebook under War Scholar. On YouTube under War Scholar 1945. And on Twitter under War Scholar. Thank you, and I hope you return to this podcast for more 
great military history.